America has been plagued with unspeakable crimes and unexplained phenomena that have captured nationwide attention and intrigue, demanding answers and retribution. However, many of these mysteries never get explained. Mysteries to this day that are still thwarting the best efforts of countless law enforcement and investigative teams. Serial killers never identified. Treasures lost. Murderers never caught. And conspiracy upon conspiracy spinning into tangled webs of inconclusive evidence and unresolved truths. This compelling documentary series presents a countdown of America's 60 most notorious unsolved mysteries and crimes in a dramatic compilation revealing these unanswered questions in 10 fascinating episodes. The countdown of America's unsolved mysteries, its most notorious cases and crimes, begins with numbers 60 through 53. The tragic disappearance of high school senior Natalie Ann Holloway. Who really discovered America? Did America's most infamous killer, John Wilkes Booth, get away with murder? And who killed Marilyn Monroe? In 2005, it became a media sensation. An 18-year-old, smart, pretty, blonde, American high school student disappears without a trace while on an exotic graduation trip to Aruba, a Caribbean island known for fun in the sun. Natalie Ann Holloway had just graduated with honors from Mountain Brook High School in Birmingham, Alabama. Along with 125 fellow students from this upper-class neighborhood, she boards a plane on May 26th for the Palm Swaying Island. Five days later, Natalie packs her bags, leaves them in her room, and heads out for a night of partying. Shortly after midnight, she is seen in a local bar by some of her schoolmates. Later, they report that she leaves with three young men, 17-year-old Horan van der Sloot, a Dutch honors student living in Aruba, and his two Surinamese friends, 21-year-old Deepak Kalpo and 18-year-old Satish Kalpo. She is never seen again. I just did a, a little piece on Natalie Holloway for the updated encyclopedia of uh, unsolved crimes. Of course, she's still a missing person, so technically it's not a crime. Uh, I don't believe there's any real doubt that she was killed, but the, uh, the three individuals that were charged down there for a while have now, well, I won't say come out as heroes of the case, but they've sued for defamation of character, and I believe one of them won a judgment that was then overturned on appeal as far as the financial award and other people have come out of the woodwork claiming that they know where she is and she's still alive. So I doubt that very much, but whether they got the right three suspects, I don't know. The tape that was on Dr. Phil where they appeared to say uh, it was so easy to have sex with her or something of that nature later turned out to have been a doctored tape. Uh, and I'm not sure whatever happened with the lawsuits from that as far as uh, 
you know, putting up phony evidence. But uh, again, unless they find the remains, I don't know how they're ever going to solve that one either. There was no lack of effort, no stone unturned. Every square inch of Aruba was searched. Natalie's mother, Beth, heroically went on TV every night, pleading for any information about her missing daughter, heroically keeping the search for her daughter alive. But five years after the disappearance, not a trace of Natalie Holloway. Short of a spontaneous confession, I don't know what incentive there would be for the actual killer to come forward. If someone had seen the crime, uh, with the rewards and so forth being available. If they weren't a participant, I think they would have come forward by now. Why one of the killers would uh, suddenly, unless he had some kind of spontaneous religious conversion or something or knew he was dying and wanted to clear his conscience, I don't know why anybody would. It always astounds me when somebody comes out of the woodwork and, you know, 60 years later, oh yeah, I shot so and so. So it may be a long wait until someone fesses up to the evil deed, or more hopefully, Natalie is discovered living a new life in Europe or South America, or is rescued from white slavery. Until then, the fate of Natalie Ann Holloway remains unknown. I haven't read a great deal about Nikola Tesla. I know that there's all kinds of stories about his uh, alternate forms of energy, and uh, he's almost become a, a fiction. Well, he has become a fictional character in some ways. On the uh, the BBC show Sanctuary, he's even cropped up as a vampire, and then he runs around helping electrocute demons and so forth. Uh, I, re I really don't know. I haven't researched much about his devices at all, but I know theories persist related to everything from UFOs to alternate universe, uh, time travel, and so forth, that uh, some of his electronic devices may still be in the works that people don't even know about being used by secret government agencies. Nikola Tesla was a Serbian-born American scientist, a genius known as the man who invented the 20th century but he is barely a footnote in American history. Look at a snapshot of the planet from outer space at night, and you see what Tesla did. He lit up the world through his invention of alternating current. His other inventions include the radio, fluorescent lights, the logic circuit that forms the basis of all computers, wireless remote control, radar, hydropower generators, the electric motor of today, and of course, what he is most famous for and bears his name, the powerful and mysterious Tesla coil. A coil that was involved in what Tesla regarded as his most important discovery, terrestrial stationary waves. Waves that could be used to light up the world wirelessly and for free. A principle he demonstrated during his most productive year, 1900. The year he lived and worked in Colorado Springs, Colorado. One of the more interesting things of what he did is he came to uh, Colorado Springs and it was here where he was going to uh, first of all do studies on lightning. He had a penchant for lightning and that's why we associate a lightning with him so much. And once here in Colorado Springs he put together what's known as a cohair. And I don't, <clears throat> I don't know if you're familiar with it or not but it actually what it does is it takes a measure of static electricity in the air. But the thing about lightning that Tesla discovered is he couldn't control it. 
There was no way he thought he could harvest it. He tried lots of different maneuvers in an attempt to harness lightning, but he finally gave up on it and uh, got into other things, such as the wireless transmission of electricity. Now there's a lot of uh, controversy as to whether or not he developed wireless electricity. And uh, my feeling is that he did. What he supposedly did was he ran this coil up to its full potential and injected a signal into the ground about 26 miles away up in Palmer Lake, uh, Colorado, just north and west of Colorado Springs. There was a setup of 100, 100 watt bulbs. And at this particular place, there were witnesses that saw this array of bulbs illuminate. In essence, the light bank was plugged into the earth, receiving electricity or electromagnetic waves transmitted through the ground. Nobody's really sure how he did it, but here's a simple demonstration using a radio transmitter, which in turn uses a modified Tesla coil. It easily and wirelessly lights up the bulb. So, why hasn't the world embraced Tesla's greatest invention? Green, free, wireless power to light up the world. That's a good question. The one thing we know for sure about who got to America first, who discovered America, the one thing we know is that it wasn't Christopher Columbus. There have been all kinds of outrageous uh, stone forts that were supposed to have been built by the Irish in the middle of Tennessee. And uh, I've heard of caves where they're supposed to have found uh, Roman coins and, and Roman artifacts in, in the middle of Illinois. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really hard to say how much of this is wishful thinking and how much of it, well, for all we know, may be legitimate. Following his origins in Africa and migration into Asia and Europe, Early man had the capability of reaching America as early as 50,000 years ago. Whether he did or not is unclear. However, 13,000 years ago, Paleo-Indians, known as the Clovis culture, were present in America, from the East Coast to the desert Southwest. They undoubtedly came by watercraft. But whether they came from Asia or from Europe is a hotly debated topic today. But for most, the question of who reached America first is really the question of who discovered the descendants of the early Clovis culture hunters. If I had to pick anybody I think got here first, it would have been the Vikings. Uh, they were the seafaring group of people who went out exploring, looking for places to conquer. And uh, I think them stumbling onto, as far as their ancient writings go, uh, the Newfoundland area, I do think they probably reached here long, long, long before Columbus did. Of the various claimants to the title of discoverer of America, I have a particular fondness for St. Brendan and his company of Irish monks, if, if only because the story of their journey is so entertaining. Uh, they came, for example, to an island on fire from which they were pelted by hot rocks, and Brendan concluded they had reached the edge of hell. Or they came, they came ashore on another island which then started to move, and Brendan concluded this was the ocean's largest fish. If these stories are true, then Brendan reached America about a thousand years before Columbus. Irish? 
Scandinavians, even the Chinese. Or maybe it was aliens who brought a few Egyptians over to get the great Mayan civilization going. The mystery rages on. April 14th, 1865. The Civil War is over. Five days before, Southern General Robert E. Lee surrendered to Northern General Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Slavery is abolished. The Union has been preserved. And President Abraham Lincoln the savior of the country, the great emancipator of slaves, the man who shepherded the Union through the long four years of bitter, bloody fighting, could at last bask in his triumph. But at the height of his triumph, while enjoying a pleasant night out with his wife at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C., He is shot from behind by a man whose name will always be remembered in infamy, John Wilkes Booth. Who shot Lincoln was never in doubt. When John Wilkes Booth leaped onto the stage of the Ford's Theater, everyone recognized him as one of the country's most famous actors. And he made no attempt to hide his identity. Everyone knows this piece of history knows that when John Wilkes Booth leapt to the stage, he shouted, Sig Semper Tyrannis! Semper Tyrannis! Thus always to tyrants. Everyone knows that Booth, even after breaking his leg, managed to escape, and wasn't caught until 12 days later, while hiding in a barn. Everyone knows that Booth resisted arrest, the barn was set on fire, and then a Union soldier, against orders, shot Booth in the neck. Booth was hauled from the barn and died moments later. This cowardly assassin paid for his crime. Or did he? For a later generation, the Kennedy assassination was something that everybody talked about. Uh, but for years prior to that, it was always the Lincoln assassination. For nearly a century, uh, there was always a lot of questions and a lot of conspiracies around it. And I think the biggest unsolved mystery connected to it has always been whether or not John Wilkes Booth was really killed. Booth definitely killed Lincoln, but I don't think that it was Booth that was captured in that barn in Virginia a short time later. Um, there was, again, a lot of mystery about the body that was discovered uh, or the man that was taken in. Uh, the body was never identified by anyone who actually knew Booth. Um, yes, people were familiar with him because he was a stage actor at the time, but again, it was, it was a different time period. There were photographs that existed, but the body didn't appear because of the damage that had been done to him. Um, some pretty hard living over a couple of weeks, uh, plus the, uh, the fire in the barn and the gunshot. People weren't really sure. They couldn't identify him. They asked his brother, Edwin, to identify the body. He never did. Um, he, in fact, wouldn't even look at the body. Um, and he wasn't even brought in to identify the body until two years later, after he'd been buried underneath the floor of an armory in Maryland for, for two years. Um, there were a lot of questions about the eye color of the corpse. Uh, there were questions about the leg that was broken. Uh, there were actually two different stories told about uh, some said it was the right leg, some said it was the left. Uh, nobody was ever really clear on that. Um, the surgeon that was brought in to identify Booth by his scars couldn't do it. In fact, he filed a report later that said he was unable to identify the man. So there's always been a question as to whether or not John Booth Wilkes Booth got away. So how could Booth have escaped? He was the most wanted man in America was a famous actor, easily identified. 
I don't think it was a conspiracy that that set up anybody. I think it was sort of a wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. I don't I don't think that there was anyone who was actually put in Booth's place. I think that um, one of the conspirators was was actually traveling with someone else, and he was mistaken for Booth. Um, Again, you, you get into a situation where you it's a different time period. There was no DNA. There weren't any fingerprints to take. Um, any man with dark hair and a mustache, uh, and by that point a beard, uh, could have been mistaken for John Wilkes Booth at the time, especially in a very passionate, fevered, rusted judgment kind of situation that was going on at the time. You have to remember that we had literally just ended the Civil War when the Lincoln assassination took place. Um, Washington, Virginia, Maryland, an entire area was, was in an uproar um, in a variety of different ways. And they, they sent out someone to find Booth and um, he was shot to death even though he was supposed to have been brought back alive. Can anyone doubt Booth wasn't operating alone? He had friends in high places. In particular, Confederate President Jefferson Davis was a close associate. Booth was not just some crazed actor looking for the limelight. He was a deeply committed Confederate. Uh, he adamantly defended independence and slavery. He hated Lincoln for destroying both. And in that sense, he was not so different from Davis or much of the Confederacy. Booth's co-conspirators are not so easily identified. Secretary of State William Stanton always believed that the plot to murder Lincoln originated with Lincoln's counterpart, Jefferson Davis. There was never enough evidence to bring Davis to trial. But in the 1980s, a retired CIA officer named William Tidwell uh, found in the Confederate papers in the Library of Congress documents showing that millions of dollars had been allocated for uh, what was called secret service projects. Uh, Tidwell also noted that during the post-assassination flight, Booth was aided by Southern agents. But Tidwell and others have succeeded in restoring a political component to the assassination uh, by highlighting the extent of clandestine Confederate operations. If Booth survived, if he wasn't the man who was pulled from that burning barn, what happened to him? Interestingly, there was an, an attorney named Finnis Bates several, quite a few years later uh, in Oklahoma who was contacted by a man named um, John St. Helen who claimed on his deathbed that he was John Wilkes Booth. In fact, offered some pretty good evidence that he was. Uh, he told Bates this as an attorney. Bates was forced to keep his secret, but St. Helen didn't die. He actually lived. He managed to survive what he thought was this, a fatal illness and disappeared. He left town, disappeared without a trace. Uh, a number of years later, though, uh, there was word that a man named David George had died in Enid, Oklahoma, who, as it turned out, according to Finnis Bates, was the same man that he had talked to years before, uh, who said that he was John Wilkes Booth. Um, and he was convinced, and as are, were a lot of people in Enid, Oklahoma, that the man who died was John Wilkes Booth, uh, many, many years after the assassin was supposed to have been killed. Uh, his mummy actually made the rounds in, in traveling carnivals for about 50 years after that until it mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Uh, but there were quite a few stories and, and a lot of decent convincing evidence. Um, in fact, the body, uh, there was a ring removed from the stomach lining of the body that apparently the, the man who uh, had died had swallowed it uh, with the initials JWB on it. Uh, and many people felt that that was some pretty convincing evidence. Um, the autopsies were carried out here in, in, in Chicago. Um, so I've always thought that there was, there was quite a bit of mystery. And if I had to say, I would say that Booth probably got away with it. In one of the great coincidences of history, a year before Lincoln's assassination, Edwin Booth, the brother of the assassin John Wilkes Booth, saved Abraham Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln. At the train station in Jersey City, New Jersey, 
Edwin pulled Todd from the path of a moving train. And many years later, Robert Todd Lincoln would add fuel to the fire of conspiracy theorists by burning some of his father's papers. Papers that told the real story behind Lincoln's assassination and the fate of John Wilkes Booth. Mad. For illustration, this present and illustrious lexicographer is no firmer in the faith of his own sanity than is any inmate of any madhouse in the land. From the Devil's Dictionary, written by Ambrose Bierce. And perhaps revealing of Bierce's mysterious vanishing. An American author a contemporary of Mark Twain and Stephen Crane. An American author who gained as much cachet from his disappearance as his literature. The great literary disappearance of Ambrose Bierce. Has anybody today heard of Ambrose Bierce? Once upon a time, he was a very popular American writer in the late 1800s, short story writer, journalist. He wrote a, a, a wonderful satirical uh, a dictionary called the Devil's Dictionary with these fantastic uh, definitions. Peace is the interlude of cheating between two wars, uh, you know, funny definitions. Ambrose Bierce was a very famous writer. In 1913, uh, he's 71 years old, and he decides that he's going to go down to Mexico to join up with uh, Pancho Villa in the Mexican Revolution and essentially observe, cover him as a journalist or as a writer. Pancho Villa was a famous revolutionary Mexican general whose overthrow of the Mexican government had been supported surreptitiously by the Americans. Here he is, photographed at Fort Bliss with Brigadier General John J. Pershing and a young Lieutenant George Patton. But in 1914, Villa fell out of favor with the Woodrow Wilson government. So why would Bierce, a well-known American author, head into the lion's den? Was he sent there to spy? Or did he tragically not know about America's change of policy? No one knows for sure what happened to him. Some of his friends actually felt that he committed suicide, that maybe he had gone off somewhere and had killed himself because he was uh, older and he was ailing and he had some things that were wrong with him and they, they thought maybe he just committed suicide. Uh, others think that maybe because of his old age, he, he died during the grueling marches between battles. Or Some people think that because he was this very uh, hard to deal with, sarcastic, cynical man that maybe he angered Pancho Villa. There was a rumor that, that Villa had had him shot. Um, others claimed that they saw this old gringo riding along with Pancho Villa to the very end. Um, I'd like to think he, he, he made it. He just sort of disappeared in time, probably died of old age, or maybe was shot to death during one of the battles. Um, I'd like to think he, he made it and, and, and managed to kind of ingratiate himself with Pancho Villa and died, you know, living his last adventure. Some people have suggested, you know, there's always doubters, there's always the conspiracy theorists, and some people have suggested that Bierce really mailed this last letter home but then didn't go with Pancho Villa and use this as a way to disappear. It's not clear to me why Ambrose Bierce would want to disappear. I think it's far more likely that what he wanted to do was try to find great subject matter that he could write about and get in the public eye with one more time. Of all of America's literary giants, Ambrose Bierce is the only one whose epitaph reads, born 1842, died, question mark.
I've been to his grave. It's a beautiful grave in uh, France and Paris, and people visit it to this day, but to the best of my knowledge, he's in it. Whose grave? The greatest cult rock star of all time, Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison was everything a rock star should be. Long-haired, androgynous, leather-clad, sexy baritone lead singer of The Doors. He was a poet, the living embodiment of Dionysus. Graduates film school, joins a rock band, has lots of sex, takes lots of drugs, and dies young at the age of 27. In 1967, the Doors hit single, Light My Fire, shot up the charts. This song was full of blues, hard rock, and psychedelia, with a vague voodoo vibe. It was poetry, poetry from a pouting rock god. You know that I would be a liar if I was to say to you, girl, we couldn't get much right. But just four years later, Morrison was in a bad way. He had left the band and moved to Paris with his girlfriend, Pamela Corson. Jim Morrison's death uh, in 1971, I've always felt this probably one of the more mysterious deaths in, in rock and roll history. Um, just because of Morrison's fascination with the poet Arthur Rimbaud, who, sick of fame, decided that he was just going to disappear one day, and he vanished completely without a trace. Everyone assumed he was dead until he turned up years later, uh, pretty much on his deathbed in a, in a, in a rundown hostel in, in France. Um, Morrison was fascinated with the fact that Rimbaud had done this, and if you know anything about Jim Morrison, you know that by the end of his career, he was pretty sick and tired of fame. Um, he grew a beard, gained some weight to get away from the image that he'd always have, and, and moved to Paris with Pamela, his longtime girlfriend. Um, they moved into an apartment and he lived a very low-key life for a while and then suddenly in early July of 71 news came that Morrison had overdosed on heroin in his bathtub in his Paris apartment. Now there were a few things that made this odd. For one thing, Morrison was not a known heroin user. Um, alcohol was always in his drug of choice. Um, heroin was something he didn't really use much of and was terrified of needles. So the fact that he'd shot himself up with an overdose seemed odd. But what seemed even stranger was the fact that the authorities were called in to investigate this and then ruled the whole thing an accident. So no autopsy was ever carried out. By the time any of anybody besides Pamela, who actually knew Jim Morrison, made it to Paris, like Ray Manzarek of the Doors, they found that Morrison had already been quickly buried in Père Lachaise Cemetery. Um, it turned out that the doctor who signed the death certificate didn't actually exist. So there were a lot of questions as to what really happened to Jim Morrison. Probably the only person who would have ever have kept his secrets was the one person who was with him, which was Pamela. Um, she died a few years later, but Morrison, many people, myself included, believe that he got tired of fame and fortune and just decided to cash it all in. Now, what happened to him, I don't know. I, I don't know where he might be living now, but I think he certainly could still be alive and living out uh, a, a quiet existence somewhere, which is what he claimed he always wanted. So um, that I think is, is, I think, one of rock and roll's great unsolved mysteries, but it's one that I don't think we should try too hard to solve. The 
Vice President, the late Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe was Hollywood's biggest starlet ever. The goddess of glamour. The ultimate object of desire for red-blooded American males. Red-blooded males such as the sitting president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. She had been married to the biggest baseball star of the time, Jolton Joe DiMaggio. She knew everybody and everything. So when she turned up dead in her apartment on August 5th, 1962, it shocked the nation. The L.A. coroner's office hastily informed the world it was a case of suicide, so hastily that the media screamed cover-up. In May of 1962, Marilyn Monroe is singing happy birthday to President John F. Kennedy. It's just about a month later that she turns up dead in her apartment. They say it's a suicide, barbiturate poisoning, but again, there's a lot of theories that, that there might be something else behind it. Some people say that the, uh, that the Kennedys might be behind it because Marilyn Monroe was in love with John Kennedy and that she wanted to marry him and they had to kind of get her out of the way. Investigations revealed the autopsy was botched. Also, the official death certificate listed the cause of death as probable suicide, with the word probable inscribed in pencil. There are certainly some oddities about the case. Uh, the fact that the body was apparently moved and then returned to her house after uh, she was found unconscious. Uh, I've read several different theories, uh, whether or not she was uh, attempting suicide, whether she killed herself because she'd been abandoned by the Kennedys, or whether someone uh, went to her apartment and poisoned her. Uh, again, this comes back to the same, uh, the whole sort of uh, almost like a whirlpool of activity around Cuba, uh, the attempts to kill Castro. Uh, the Kennedy war against organized crime. Many of these things could have been revealed to uh, Marilyn Monroe in pillow talk, uh, so to speak, and it was uh, feared perhaps that she would go public uh, if either John or Bobby didn't agree to keep seeing her. There's been the suggestion that Robert Kennedy visited with Marilyn Monroe shortly before her death to say what, to do what, to get her to maybe back off a little bit, nobody knows. But that, uh, that is one of the things that has some people convinced that all is not what it seems there. That it was convenient for her, whether it was a suicide or an accident, uh, it would be better if she just didn't wake up. Who would benefit most from Marilyn Monroe's death would have been both of the Kennedys at that time because she'd apparently had affairs with both John and Robert. Again, anybody in the Kennedy White House probably would have been glad to see her shuffle off the coil. Could a murder conspiracy exist at the highest level? The only way we'll ever know is if records from the FBI or some other governmental agency suddenly turn up. Because today, a half century later, the three people who knew what really happened are all dead. Curiously, all of them, Monroe, John Kennedy, and Robert Kennedy, died under suspicious circumstances. According to Joseph Smith's autobiography, in 1823, an angel appeared to him and told him where he could un unbury some golden plates and how he could read the hieroglyphics on them. In 1830, having supposedly translated these hieroglyphics, Smith published the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon is a sacred book, a sacred text creating a new religion. All the world's religions have similarly strange holy events, supernatural events, 
that the true believers accept on faith. Moses received the Ten Commandments written in stone by the finger of God. Christ ascended from the cross. For Mormons, Joseph Smith's miraculous rendering of the Book of Mormon is their supernatural event. The question is not who wrote the Book of Mormon. That was clearly Joseph Smith. The question is how, in an educated farm boy whose mother said he could barely read or write, how he could write a complex literary work. Joseph Smith was not a well-educated man when he created the Book of Mormon. He was never known for being a writer. Um, and even if you don't believe what's in it, it's a pretty massive and, and varied and interesting work of fiction or nonfiction, depending on your belief. But it's a pretty amazing book for a man to have created. So I think that a lot of people who believe in the Golden Tablets will say that that's why they believe in them, because it was created by someone who shouldn't have been able to create it. Who was this Joseph Smith? He was a one-time farmer and treasure seeker who supposedly used white seer stones and sometimes a salamander to find treasure. But he was also a well-known con man. Joseph Smith uh, and the foundation of the Mormon Church, um, it's, it's well known now in history, although not admitted by the Mormon Church per se, that Smith had been involved in various kinds of swindles and so forth before he uh, supposedly discovered these uh, golden tablets or they were delivered to him by the angel Moroni. He had been involved in some shady land deals, some investment uh, scandals that uh, had uh, not been to the best uh, benefit of his investors. And I think it's very suspicious that no one else would be allowed to see the uh, tablets and that when he repeated them, when, he, when the original transcript was lost and uh, they came back to have him read them again, there were discrepancies which he said proved that they were true rather than prove that he was just making it up as he went along. But even if Smith was a con man, that doesn't explain how an illiterate farmer could produce such a great literary work that over 12 million Mormons believe to be true. Those who believe that Joseph Smith was really a con artist who created his own religion uh, will say that it was all something that worked out of his own mind. Smith never showed the plates to anyone else. He, he claimed that he wasn't allowed to. Um, and according to his story, you wouldn't have been able to read them anyway because you could only read them by using a pair of magic spectacles to be actually be able to read the writing on them. Um, and then when he was finished, writing out the Book of Mormon. He uh, then gave the tablets back and then they have then disappeared. One simple explanation for how Smith came up with the stories in the Book of Mormon was that he didn't. Uh, this, at the time, stories about Indian origins abounded. Preachers like Jonathan Edwards and Cotton Mather had already speculated that Indians came from the lost tribes of Israel. So one simple theory is that Smith simply drew from the popular culture of the time and perhaps then only later decided to sell it as Holy Scripture. Was Joseph Smith sly like a fox? Was he smart enough to know that to be a success, a religion had to have a mythic beginning, a supernatural founding? a fantastic creation myth that would give it pizzazz, that would turn people into true believers, that would turn the followers into the Mormon faithful. <laughs>